Uh, welcome everyone to his way. I'm Tom Rose, the director. Um, I'm glad for this time, and I was thinking as we were getting ready to uh, meet this morning. Uh, back in 1979, I became a Christian. I became a Christian at the University of Washington through a ministry called Campus Advance for Christ. Uh, it was a group of college students that moved up from uh, Lubbock, Texas to start the campus of the University of Washington. That's how I was first introduced to the Lord. Um, and one of the things that we were big on, three times a year we had retreats. You know, typical retreats, we go up to the mountains and have these weekend-long retreats. But one of the things we were adamant about is that we would never let them be called retreats. That we were always emphasis as the idea that retreat implied defeat, retraction, um, that type of thing, and that we call them advances, that we're moving forward, not moving backward. And it just struck me that um, as we are, as a world, kind of retracting, as we're retreating, as we are pulling in, social distancing, quarantining, those kind of things, I think it's important for God's people to advance, to move forward, to move into that space, move into those things that are being vacated with the gospel, because as the, our community retreats, it leaves open space for God's kingdom to step in and fill. And so one of the reasons why we want to do this, and we're kind of quarantined here in a sense, and we can't go out to um, our local churches and all, we're doing it here, is so that ultimately we can advance. Um, and one of the things I appreciate as I look at what's going on in our um, society right now is that I do see a lot of Christians moving in um, to these opportunities with um, um, you know, video streaming their services. And, and one of the things that I think people are beginning to discover, uh, which is not a new concept, but that Christianity isn't limited to a building, but that it actually needs to be expressed and experienced within a community, and particularly within a home. And originally, if you see the original church, it met in homes. And we've gotten so accustomed to big buildings and big events and big programs that maybe we lost the heart. And God's given us an opportunity to rediscover that heart and advance into house churches, into small communities, and, and that type of thing to deepen and, uh, and make richer um, our Christian experience. Um, one of the things I did want to do is have a few minutes to pray um, specifically for the uh, coronavirus pandemic that, you know, even the other day, just kind of uh, yesterday, when I was mowing the lawn, it just all of a sudden kind of struck me that this is something that isn't just being experienced in Alabama or Huntsville or in the United States, but it's, it's worldwide. I mean, there's no place untouched that there are people, and whether it's in Fiji or in Africa or wherever it is. And so I thought for a few minutes we would... Um, just have a map up and, and statistics and numbers and just get a feel for what's going on and just get have a time of quiet reflection and prayer um, for the Father, we thank you for hearing our cries. Father, as the world cries out to you for help, we know that you're there. We know that you're on your throne. We know that you are King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the greatest great physician. And Father, we thank you that you are working a purpose through this and that you will be glorified in it and that you will uh, draw all men to yourself through this hour of need. And Father, I pray that you will speak with all those that we care about, those that others care about, and that they can impact you throughout the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the things I want to do is, is also uh, share our story. And so I asked Nick to come here. Nick Harris um, is going to share for a few minutes um, his story. Um, Nick um, came to his way almost two years ago. Um, he's 25 years old. Um, he graduated six months. He graduated one year and decided he just didn't want to leave. So um, he has stayed on as one of our house managers. He is. Um, going to Calhoun, uh, working on a computer science degree. And uh, one of the things that Nick has had on his heart, I know for a long time, is music and expressing his faith through that. He's going to, we're going to share some of that in a minute. Um, but Nick, first of all, I'd just like you maybe share a minute just about what your journey of spiritual recovery has been like for you. 
Well, you pretty much took everything I was going to say. It's not supposed to do a testament that you had said everything I was going to say, but my spiritual journey has been kind of slow because I waited to get baptized until I graduated the program. And I feel like, for me, that's probably the best decision I made because I wanted to do it for me and not for the program or what people would think if I got baptized in the program. So I feel like it's been personally slow because I feel like I'm a new Christian and it's a total race, not a sprint. So that's how it's been. Okay. What kind of things are you doing today to kind of strengthen your spiritual recovery? I know you're not quite in the structure that you were in the first year where you had classes and all those kind of things on a regular basis. So what kind of things are you doing to keep yourself strong, keep yourself focused, and, and continue to grow in your recovery? Well, it's important for me to be mindful of what I allow myself to view and listen to. I know when I was younger, I would watch a lot of TV and music that wasn't really good for me mentally. So I've been trying to be mindful of like what I allow to be put in my mind because what goes in will also come out. So I try to keep positive influences around me here and outside of here because I think it's good for me mentally health. Okay. Good. What kind of goals do you have? When you look, I mean, I realize you're in college right now, but as you look forward to a career, look forward, you know, your future, you're a young guy, um, a lot of possibilities in front of you. Um, what kind of things are you looking forward to? What kind of things are you anticipating in the future? Well, really, I don't know. I just really want to survive, for one. <coughs> My expectations for myself have always been just to get through the day, you know? And I feel like, for me, it's important to just finish what I start for one. Because I never thought I'd be in a position to where I could go to college and finish. So I think just baby steps. First, I just want to complete school. And then once I get finished with that, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. So just finish. Well, one of the things I know that you've gotten into lately is, is writing some songs and, and performing some songs that um, have been meaningful to you. I know we are going to um, listen to one at the moment. Maybe you can kind of tell us what that song was about, where it came from, um, why you uh, took together these particular lyrics, and what kind of, how does it express kind of where you were at or where you are at in your faith today? Okay, well, I needed a theme song per se, because whenever I get in the car, like I listen to rap, but it doesn't really like correlate with what I'm going through. <laughs> So I thought like the best thing I could do is to like give my best attempt at making music that is recovery based, but not like to Disney Channel, you know, like something that's real. So I went to the studio, this was the second song I did, and I had the chorus done and I just kind of went off of what was on my heart at the time. And it came out better than I thought it would, so put it on YouTube and the rest is history. What's the name of the song? Never going back. No go around. What we're listening to. Can't 
tell me that I'm not enough Cause through his name I have everything No going back now, it's a wrap now No going back now, God's got me now No going back now, it's a wrap now No going back now, God's got me now Look how far you've come And all because You put the work in It's working Look what God has done You put him in front No more running Look how far you've come It's not done This is the beginning Of living Keep pushing forward It's not over Look what God has done, look how far you've come No going back now, it's a wrap now No going back now, God's got me now I met him halfway, that's why I'm sober today You can do it too, just have some faith Nick, I appreciate that. It's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to share a brief message after that. We'll have some time for the guys if you want to share um, some things that are on your heart. Um, that'd be great. Um, you know, we're in a world today that's overcome with fear, with panic. With uncertainty, truly consumed. Um, you know, and it, it struck me that as I think about our journey in, in addiction and recovery, one of the fundamental things is that addiction is about what we consume consuming us, right? You know, we start out kind of in charge of it, but over time, it gets charge of us. And I think we're familiar with that. We are walking that. We are walking now in recovery. The world isn't so familiar with it. And they are now dealing with an addiction of sorts as well. Being overwhelmed with something. Being consumed by something. And there's a passage in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19 that just kind of jumped out at me. It said, for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Then, there's a number of times when the scriptures talk about being overcome that I find interesting. Um, I'm not going to cover all of them, but one of them was interesting in Daniel chapter 8. It talks about Daniel being overcome with sickness. And that he was incapable of doing anything because he was overcome with sickness and illness. And that consumed his life. In Jeremiah 23 and verse 9, as Jeremiah talks about his prophecy, he says this. It says, concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me, all my bones shake, I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord, and because of his holy words. I mean, Jeremiah is so wanted to explain how overcome he was with what God was calling him to, that he used the picture of a drunken man on wine to describe that picture. That every faculty, that everything about his life was consumed with wine. Just like Jeremiah was consumed with God's Word. There's a story in the book of Acts that I always find funny. It's a young man by the name of Eutychus. Uh, in fact, back in our campus ministry days, we always had an annual banquet. And we always gave out a little trophy called the Eutychus Award. Um, now, the story of Eutychus is this, that um, the church had, been, had met on a Sunday evening up, up in an upper room. The Apostle Paul was in town, and so as they gathered together to take the Lord's Supper, Paul began preaching because he was going to be leaving. It was their last time to hear him. And he went on preaching, it says, until midnight. During that time, Eutychus, who was sitting in a window cell on the third story, was overcome with sleep and fell out of the window 
three stories to the ground to his death. Paul would go down and, uh, and revive him and bring him back up. And interestingly, that was not the end of the church service. No, Paul continued to preach until daylight. Uh, but it just struck me as interesting that, that again, I mean, who falls out of a three-story window to their death except when they're overcome by something else? So this idea of being overcome means that we are going to go into things and be and do things that we wouldn't normally do. And I think about our society today. We're overcome. You know, we're overcome with fear. We're overcome with uncertainty. Um, sometimes we're overcome with anger. We're overcome with even um, substance abuse. You know, I was talking to a guy just the other day who um, relapsed and went out. And, uh, I mean, he has stitches today. He has cases today. He has charges today. And he has no idea what happened. I mean, he doesn't remember. He blacked out numerous times in that day. And doesn't even remember or recall the things that people are charging him with. That's consumed. That's what happens when we allow ourselves to be consumed. So, what consumes you? You consume what consumes you. You know, um, most of America is trapped in their homes. What are we going to be? We're, we're finding our lives limited. The question becomes, what's going? What am I going to consume that's going to consume me? Sometimes we get trapped now in front of the news networks. And we're hammered day in and day out about what's going on in our world. Um, that's a choice we make. And we then are consumed by those things. You know, here's the good news. In John 1 and verse 5, as John describes and introduces Jesus into the world, he says that light has come into darkness and that the darkness could not extinguish the light. See, the good news is when light comes into darkness, darkness loses. When good comes into evil, evil loses. When God enters the picture, Satan loses. And so the good news that we need to embrace is the fact that we're not losing if we're walking with the Lord, we're winning. There's a passage as Jesus is getting ready to leave um, with his apostles. And it says in John 16 and verse 31, as he is explaining, preparing his apostles for his departure, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus is anticipating and even predicting his disciples' abandonment. Um, why would they abandon him? I mean, earlier Jesus said that the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. And yet, the disciples were offended by that idea, right? They're opposed to No way. We will never do that. We are all in with you. And so three of his very dearest disciples, he brings into a garden to participate with him in the most passionate and, and heart-rending and overwhelming experience of Jesus' life. And he asked them simply, watch and pray with me. And after praying intensely, he comes back to them. And the scriptures say that they were overcome with sleep. <coughs> they were overcome with sleep. He asked, can you not keep watch with me for even one hour? These men who would die for me? Yet they were overcome with sleep. Jesus recognizes. You know, our spirit's willing. Yeah, we have the best of intentions, but our flesh is weak. And so we get overcome. 
When Jesus is arrested, the apostles' immediate response is to be overcome with rage. They grab knives, they begin attacking, they begin defending Jesus to their death. But Jesus tells them to put your sword away. Because those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And they're once again left confused. By then, Jesus' prophecy is now coming to fulfillment, right? That the sheep, the shepherd's been struck. And now the sheep will scatter as Jesus begins to look. The apostles run into the darkness of the garden, disappearing. Later on, we find Jesus arrested on trial and being accused. And Peter has kind of slunk back into the periphery of that situation. To watch, maybe. To hope. And yet, three times, Peter's asked by servant girls, weren't you with him? Weren't you one of them? And he adamantly denies it because he's overcome with fear. Three times denied until recognizing at the crow of a rooster what he had done and how once again Jesus had anticipated exactly what he was in spite of what he wanted to be. And he went. See, in the midst of our failures, Jesus promises this. Take heart. I have overcome the world. I overcome your fears. I overcome your doubts. I overcome your panic. I overcome your rage. I even overcome your sleepy bodies. I have overcome the world. See, I think a lot of times we get the idea that we're supposed to change the world. But I think in large part the world is what the world will be. Evil is what evil will be. The flesh is what the flesh will be. Darkness is what darkness will be. And sometimes people are what people are. Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome. See, our victory isn't necessarily getting everything to change like we want it to be. It's not allowing it to rule us anymore. See, in the world you have tribulation. But you don't have to let the world's tribulation create your tribulation. Because Jesus has overcome the world. And we overcome the world through Him. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 4, John will write, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe Jesus is the Son of God? You've been born again, born of God, then you are an overcomer by faith. But the world doesn't decide what you are, and what you think, and what you believe, and what you choose. In Romans 12, Paul emphasizes that idea to the believers. Romans 12, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So, here's the deal. We are to live at peace with everybody. Does that mean that there's going to be peace everywhere? No. But here's the good news. It's overcome the world. So peace can be the relationship that we have with those around us. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for his written vengeance is mine, our pace says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with the good. <clears throat> you see, we don't have to let other people's opinions drive our opinions. 
We don't have to let other people's decision about our relationship drive our relationship with those other people. We don't have to retaliate. We don't have to give back in kind. Because we've overcome the world through Jesus Christ by God. And so we can love when we've been hated. We can give when we have had taken. We can forgive when we have been mistreated and abused. The last passage I want to mention um, is in Romans 8. As Paul ends this chapter and really this whole laying out of this wonderful gospel message that transforms us into these people. It says in Romans 8 and verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is God who justifies who is it to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of God. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're more than conquerors. We overcome in Christ. That's the gospel. That's our message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for overcoming the world for us that we may walk in your victory. In Jesus' name I pray. Yeah. I went on a spiritual retreat one time. And uh, when I came back from that spiritual I was greatly fortified, strengthened, and uh, I didn't want to lose that feeling. Um, but I knew if I didn't do anything about it, that over time the flame would go fainter and fainter. And I didn't want that to happen. So I went to a bookstore and I looked around the bookstore and there was the uh, Christian literature and I walked down there and wow, the rows of Christian literature in this bookstore. And I didn't think I, I was a new Christian. And uh, I was a new Christian because I was experiencing a new life in my Christianity will happen throughout a Christian's life. God will take you to the next level. And so I did what I was taught at that retreat. And I bowed my head. And I said, God, I don't know what to read. But I'm counting on you to point it out to me and show me what you need for me to know. And so I opened my eyes and I looked up at the shelf and right there it was. It was a book, a white book, uh, just a small book. And it was written by Mother Teresa and it was called No Greater Love. And I'll tell you uh, what that book has meant to me. It's been a true blessing. It can be that easy. So when Tom was talking about that he wants us to have our ideas about overcoming, I did the same thing. I just went back to my room and I sat down and I said, God, uh, surely amongst all those thrift store books that I've been buying, uh, there's something in there about overcoming. And so 
I didn't have to look any further than my nightstand. There was this book called Perhaps Today by David Jeremiah. And so I just started perusing it. And sure enough, here we are, overcomers. So I said, okay, let's see what you have to say to us today. So far, except for divine intervention, this world is a lost cause. Don't fall in love with it. You have an anointing from God. You can abide in God's truth every day as you abide in Christ. You can overcome it. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Soldiers of Christ, says John Charles Wesley, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through His eternal Son. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. 1 Chronicles 28, 20. And then the prayer. Dear Lord, our God, what a wonderful thought that I am an overcomer through the one who overcame sin, death, and the world for me. Thank you, blessed Redeemer, for your sacrifice. Amen. Thank you. This song has been around time for a while. It took some time to finally all come together. I really sure it doesn't know what it is. Uh, I've sort of always been like an AA and everything, and I, I've sort of been, uh, took a while for me to really get to the big, big book. And, uh, but I heard that they, uh, they got a lot of their readings before the AA book from the book of James. So I read it two years ago, and it was short, and that's the reason I read it too. <laughs> But they was a saying that it jumped out at me, man, like nothing I've ever seen. And it, it goes from uh, James, uh, let's see, uh, 4 through uh, 8. It says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Forgive generously to God without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, mystery with them time. <clears throat> Such person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. And I've been that person my whole life. Up and down, and, uh, in and out, uh, tossed about, in and out of these places, you know, no, no, uh, no perseverance in anything of this. And I was counseling with Thomas uh, a few weeks ago, and I've always said, you know, I've always heard, you know, do God's will, seek to do God's will. And I'm like, what is God's will? I always ask that question. And they told me. And I think it goes along with this, and it, thinking this will help me to stay single minded, focused on God. And it's from Thessalonians uh, 5. 16 to 18, this is, and I think this is important for all of us to do right now through all these uh, situations going on. It says, uh, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, we're all, like you said, you know, we're all at the point right now, we're having to look at ourselves, we're having to quarantine, you know, sort of stay separated. And I'll prepare you for that day when we can walk out of this treatment center. Everybody's going to walk out of their houses out there and you know, get back to the workplace. And hopefully, we'll all be better when we do be prepared. You know, so we won't be tossed about like a, 
like a, a bone in the sea. And, uh, you know, so anyway, I just, uh, grateful for this opportunity, grateful to be here today. <coughs> Appreciate y'all. Thanks. Doug and I went out and talked to Lavalice out of Madison County a few weeks ago. One of the verses I shared, and it, it has to do with overcoming, I'll tell you. 15 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I am them, bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. So I just make it short, you know, to, to overcome. Alcohol and drugs, you know, that's not an easy thing. And if we don't have God by our side, we don't have, we're not a branch of His vine. You know, to me, I think it's almost impossible. We got to have Him with us all the time. And and, and, and I'm going to challenge all of us this week, myself included. You know, uh, you hear me at the big reading, you know, singing Jesus on the main line, but every time I sing that, I get fired up for the Lord. It's just one of those songs that just gets you excited. So, you know, let's, let's all try to pray a little more this week. Just, just, if we pray five times a day, let's pray ten, two, three, four. Pray more this week, you know, because Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. You just got to call him up and tell him what you want.